welcome back everyone to another Space News Roundup from me. The past seven days certainly saw a lot of Space News action, from Starship, the final ever Atlas V launch from the West Coast, the return of America's secret space plane after over two years in orbit, a very Kerbal test from NASA, and much, much more. Let's jump right into things, beginning, as usual, with Starship updates. It has been another busy week for SpaceX with their Starship program. Last week, Starship Gazer caught a large new liquid oxygen cryogenic storage tank, arriving at the port of Brownsville on Tuesday after being transported from Cape Canaveral for testing. It was carted off to the relatively new SpaceX testing site, the site formerly occupied by Macy's gun range. This is interesting as it seems to confirm that the Starship Launchpad 39A site seems to be going with horizontal storage for the liquid oxygen reserves, rather than vertical storage. This this is also likely confirmation that the mysterious double-walled storage silo at the site is for water storage rather than liquid oxygen storage, given that we can now see that these tanks are labelled for liquid oxygen. If this is the case though, then SpaceX are going to need a lot more horizontal tanks at 39A than they currently have, as what they have right now is almost certainly not enough to support a full stack of Starship and Super Heavy. Speaking of the Starship launch pad at 39A, I wasn't going to talk about this photo initially since its origins are a bit dubious and almost certainly not legal, but it's been making the rounds on social media and has now permeated mainstream news aggregate sites by this point, so I think it's safe to say that the cat's out of the bag. So with that, check out this shot, poking out of this hangar door here is the orbital launch mount for the Starship launch pad at 39A. This photo was taken outside of SpaceX's hangar M, and all of this is very exciting to see. Hopefully we should see this installed very soon. Starbase Surfer caught this nice shot of inside the newest tent to be built at Starbase Texas. We're not 100% sure what this tent is going to be used for, but it's located here, and the other tents are here, but these aren't going to stay. The Star Factory building will be expanded to completely replace the three tents opposite the high and mega bays, so this new tent could be here to act as a temporary replacement for each of the three tents as they're demolished in sequence to make room for the expansion of the factory. Or is it for something else entirely? Complete speculation of course, I'd love to hear your theories in the comments down below. We saw Ship 25 undergo more cryogenic testing towards the start of last week, and following this, SpaceX lifted it off the pad and transported it back to the high bay. Don't worry, it's unlikely to go the way of Booster 8 and face what is likely to be permanent retirement. It's almost certainly going back to the high bay for a round of dotting the I's and crossing the T's, as well as, of course, installation of its Raptor 2 engines. As for the full Booster 7 Ship 24 stack, well, that ceased to be last week. The ship was lifted off the booster with the catch arms and lowered to the ground, after which it was transported over to suborbital pad B and placed on top. After this, Thursday brought forth a new round of testing for Booster 7. We saw cryogenic propellant loading into the tank, and then we saw testing of the Fire X fire suppression system, and then this. Yep, we got another Booster 7 spin prime test. So what's that? Ship 24 D-Stack? Booster 7 engine testing without the ship on top? That means things are very likely steamrolling towards a 33 engine static fire test for Booster 7. According to a recent report by NASA, a D-Stacked Booster 7 33 engine static fire test is required before the first Starship orbital flight test. So the fact that Ship 24 has been D-Stacked and preliminary engine tests on Booster 7 seem to be underway, this is a great indication that the 33 engine roar is rapidly approaching. I'd say it's likely that we'll see an incremental build up to all 33 engines. The current record for this booster is a 7 engine static fire, it's not unlikely that the next series of static fires will see a gradually increasing number of engines involved until that magical 33 number is hit. What do you think? Will 33 engines be the next static fire, or will we see a progressive approach from SpaceX? Let me know what you think in the comments down below, and hey, if you're enjoying the video so far, then don't forget to drop a like down below as well, it really helps support what I do here, and I always very much appreciate it. In last Monday's episode, I mentioned the fact that we were expecting to see an Antares 230 Plus rocket, carrying the CRS-18 Cygnus spacecraft to the International Space Station, launch on the 6th of November. However, the launch was unfortunately aborted, though there was nothing wrong with the weather, spacecraft or rocket or launch site, rather there was a fire alarm at the Mission Operations Control Center, which meant that the control center staff had to evacuate. The launch was rescheduled to the 7th of November, so Monday last week, and I'm pleased to say that this time all things went a bit more smoothly. The launch took place as planned, with the Antares rocket successfully blasting off the pad from the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport, delivering the Cygnus commercial cargo spacecraft to the International Space Station. However, things weren't 100% perfect. 
As about six hours into the flight, it was announced that one of the spacecraft's two solar arrays had failed to deploy, though Northrop Grumman, the spacecraft's manufacturer, assured us all that the vehicle would still be able to reach the station, an assessment that NASA also agreed with, allowing docking to take place with the station, which then happened on the 9th of November. In total, this launch brought around 3.7 metric tons of crew supplies and science, spacewalk and vehicle hardware to the station. It also carried four CubeSats, of which three are Earth Observation CubeSats, one from Japan, one from Uganda and one from Zimbabwe, as well as the Japanese Space Tuna 1 CubeSat, a technology demonstration satellite that will test the properties of reflective materials in space. The next launch we saw was somewhat bittersweet. On the 10th of November, we saw the final ever Atlas V launch from Vandenberg, carrying the Joint Polar Satellite System 2, the second in a series of polar orbiting environmental satellites, which in its current orbit will circle the Earth pole to pole, crossing the planet's equator 14 times per day, providing data for scientists to help forecast the weather and keep tabs on increasingly common extreme weather events. For this launch, the Atlas V launched in a 401 configuration, meaning that it flew with a 4 meter wide fairing, zero solid rocket motors and one engine on the center upper stage. Not only was this the final Atlas V launch from the Vandenberg launch site and the west coast in general, it was also the final ever Atlas V launch with a 4 meter fairing. The old girl isn't quite finished yet though, we can still look forward to 19 more launches with the final mission taking place between 2024 and 2029 carrying an operational Boeing Starliner mission with four astronauts on board to the International Space Station. I think I got a little bit ahead of myself just there though. In addition to the Joint Polar Satellite System 2, this launch also carried the low Earth orbit flight test of an inflatable decelerator, shortened to just lofted if you want to save some breath. <laughs> this was a test of an inflatable re-entry heat shield and might look a bit familiar to anyone that plays Kerbal Space Program. This was the first ever test of such a heat shield from Earth orbital speed and everything seemed to go well. The payload successfully inflated and landed just off the coast of Hawaii and hopefully subsequent inspection of the spacecraft will yield positive results. Now on the subject of Atlas V, on the 17th of May 2020, an Atlas V launched mission USA 299 and carried the mysterious Boeing X-37 space plane to orbit. There are two X-37s in service, and this particular one was the first X-37. Why am I mentioning all of this? Well, that mission, which began on the aforementioned 17th of May in 2022, finally concluded last week, on Saturday the 12th of November, after the space plane touched down at the Kennedy Space Center after spending a staggering 908 days in orbit. This X-37 mission carried the most experiments to date, and that's all we know. <laughs> yes, this elusive space plane is as mysterious as it is fascinating. We really have no idea what the United States Space Force does with this spacecraft. All that's really known is that it serves a classified purpose and has the unprecedented ability to remain in orbit for years at a time. Hopefully whatever it was trying to achieve on this latest mission was achieved successfully, but yeah, that's all we've got really. <laughs> Over in Japan, JAXA conducted a captive firing test of the first stage of their brand new H-3 launch vehicle, slated to replace the space agency's current workhorse rocket, the H-2. During this test, we saw the two LE-9 Hydrolox engines perform an apparently successful static fire test, moving this rocket one step closer to operational status. We have some more big news from the recently completed Chinese space station Tiangong. The Tianzhou-4 cargo spacecraft undocked with the Tianhe core module on the 9th of October, and before it re-entered the Earth's atmosphere for disposal, its onboard cameras captured the first ever third-person view of the fully constructed Tiangong space station. In the center, we can see the Tianhe core module, flanked by the Mengtian and Wentian laboratory modules, and below all that we can see the Shenzhou-14 spacecraft, which carried three Taikonauts on the third crewed flight to the station, currently expected to leave the station and land in Inner Mongolia sometime in December. Not long after the departure of Tianzhou-4, the Tianzhou-5 launched aboard a Long March 7Y6 from the Wenchang satellite launch site, carrying several tons of cargo to the station. This broke a new world record. This was the fastest ever rendezvous between a spacecraft and a space station, with the entire rendezvous and docking process lasting for just two hours and eight minutes. And that's from launch to docking mind, which smashes the previous record set by Soyuz MS-17, which stood at three hours and four minutes. 
That wasn't the only news we had from China last week. On Friday, we saw a Long March 6A launch a single Yunhai 3 satellite to low Earth orbit. As is usual with Chinese satellites, not a lot of information has been made publicly known, but according to official sources, the satellite will be used for atmospheric, maritime and space environment monitoring, disaster prevention and mitigation, and scientific experiments. The week's launch schedule closed off with another successful SpaceX Falcon 9 mission. This was the F9185 mission, which saw the rocket carry two communication satellites to geosynchronous Earth orbit. The satellites in question were the Galaxy 31 and 32 satellites, operated by Intelsat, a multinational satellite services provider with corporate headquarters in Luxembourg. In order to launch these two satellites to geosynchronous orbit, the Falcon 9 first stage needed to burn for longer than normal, meaning that it wouldn't have enough fuel left over to perform a landing on either the mainland or the drone ship, hence why there's no grid fins or landing legs visible in this footage. Which, you know, is kind of sad. This booster has had a long old life with SpaceX. This mission was its 14th flight overall, having previously supported the legendary Crew Demo-1 mission, the Radarsat Constellation mission, 10 Starlink missions, the SXM-7 mission, and last week's Intelsat launch. This booster was the very first to hit 10 reflights overall, and is one of the most frequently flown boosters in SpaceX's fleet. The only other boosters with 14 flights to their names are B-1058 and B-1060, both of which are planned to fly for a 15th time and land a 15th time in November and December respectively. I wonder what the upper limit is for the Falcon 9 first stage flights. Do you think we'll ever get to 20 reflights for any of them? Let me know what you think in the comments down below. And hey, consider subscribing as well so that you get notified of these videos every single Monday so that you stay in the loop about space news content. And if you hit join down there, then you can sign up to my channel membership scheme and appear on the list of names scrolling on screen. Or alternatively, you can sign up to my Patreon. Either way, both things will get your name in lights as well as access to these videos one day early and the knowledge that you are a big reason for how I am able to keep making this content for you all. Getting the rights to use a lot of this footage for this stuff isn't cheap and it's your generosity that allows me to continue making this. But all that aside, thank you so much everyone for watching and I'll see you all next time.